In this lesson, it is assumed uh, as according to the syllabus, you can see that an equivalent IGCC and O level understanding of waves is still assumed. Uh, I will still attach the link of uh, the O level syllabus videos that I have uh, on this channel uh, so that you can go through them if you have any problems with basics. But I will be going through the terms exactly which we'll be using this chapter again and again. So first, uh, he tells you, he asks in the syllabus that we need to understand what the vibration of particles in ropes, springs, and ripple tanks actually looks like. Then we need to understand the terms of displacement, amplitude, phase difference, period, frequency, wavelength, and speed. And uh, the third point, which is the CRO, I will attach the link of that video as well. That is exactly the same as in O levels. So I'm not going to repeat that in this lesson. This is going to be, is going to be purely about waves and waves only that are going to be a part of A-levels. Okay, so for the first part, uh, to understand uh, what is the motion of waves and ropes, let's look at this illustration, if you can see this. It's very clear that uh, how the particles are moving, and for a, for a single second, if you can just notice one particle, let's say, pick out this green one, and notice that this particle is only moving upwards and downwards. I'm going to play this animation again. Notice that against our own imagination and visualization, we think that the particles are moving forward, but no, it's actually the energy of the wave going forward. But the particle motion is actually perpendicular to the motion of the wave energy. Right? So let's observe this again. Notice the green particle that we just highlighted. You can see it's just moving upwards and downwards on its own fixed position. It's not moving forward and backward against whatever imagination that we already have. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so we understand how, how the wave is going to be and how, what we are visualizing about the waves. Uh, we move ahead with these terms, which is, um, I'm going to discuss phase difference later. First, we're going to look at these other terms. So what is amplitude? What is frequency and displacement? So if we go back to this visualization again, if we let it run for a while. Okay, so exactly at this moment, if we see, we have multiple points away from the mean position. So this is our mean position, right? And most of these points are actually away from them because the wave is being produced in them. So all these particles which are away from the mean position, their distances, rather their displacements, if measured, these will actually be called displacements. These are called displacements. So all of these are called displacements. And if you notice that one particle that is at the maximum displacement in all situations, that has a special name. And the special name given to that displacement is amplitude. It is still displacement, but since it's the highest one, we give it a special name that is amplitude okay and uh, one other thing that we need to understand about uh, other particles is that what is the name of the particles so if you have the particle at this point that is called a crest and if we are talking about the lowest particle in any phase we are talking about a trough okay so i hope we understand what are those terms and then let's look at the wavelength so for the wavelength we have from this peak to this peak or from this peak to this peak so basically what he tries to tell you is that from one crest to another crest and from one trough to another trough this is actually a representation of wavelength and similarly for time period as well if the axis is representing time we'll get to this confusion later as well that how to see whether this is going to be time period or wavelength and then we have uh, Another choice of wavelength that is from one starting position to the next starting position. This is also wavelength. Okay. So now we have understood what is amplitude, what is frequency and displacement, uh, and wavelength, of course. Let's look at, uh, let's discuss frequency. So frequency is basically number of waves completed in one second. Previously, the Cambridge allowed that uh, this can be represented, this can be written in English as a number of waves in unit time. Now they have specified that students need to write down that this is going to be one second exactly. Okay, so what is this one second? The formula becomes one over t because we are just looking at one wave. We are visualizing only one wave and 
the time taken for that one wave and the unit becomes hertz so frequency is equal to 1 over t and the unit is hertz hz okay uh, so we have looked at frequency as well then we're going to look at speeds now speed is simply in uh, physics we already know that speed is equal to distance over time. Now let's separate d multiplied by 1 over t. Now we've visualized that this 1 over t is actually the frequency. So let's multiply this d multiplied by f. Now what is this distance? This is actually the wavelength. Why are we looking at the wavelength? Uh, let's go to this idea again. So we're looking at the wavelength because we want to know that how much the wave has traveled from this one point to the next point. How much distance the wave has covered? So this is basically the distance traveled or distance traveled by the wave. So this is distance traveled by wave. And this is exactly the same time it takes for one particle to take one complete oscillation. So it's basically distance being covered in the same amount of time or some relative amount of time. So if we can find that, then we simply divide distance with time, which becomes a lambda and f. So it is basically the same point that we use in kinematics to understand this properly okay all right so we've also derived the formula as well of uh, v equals to f lambda we understand this formula for waves as well and let's talk about phase difference this is a bit tricky topic so let's go about this one by one first we need to understand that a single particle's motion or a movement of a particle can be represented just a moment so it can be represented as the movement of uh, a unit circle. So let's try to solve this question first, and then we're going to move towards phase difference. Now, in this question, he tells you that we have a wave that has an amplitude of 2, an amplitude of 2. But notice that in this axis, the axis is time, and here, this is distance. So from this graph, we can find out the frequency, because frequency is 1 over t. And from this graph, we can find out the wavelength, which is lambda. So this is where the examiner is going to confuse you. Please don't try to pick values from the same axis. Please be mindful that the axis has to represent the respective quantity. So over here, we have that uh, one wave takes 0 0.66 seconds. If we look at from this point to this point, or you can make your life difficult and choose these points, which are not even on the axis. I would recommend choose the simple option and move ahead. And so the, over here, the time period of one wave comes out as 0 0.6 seconds. Over here, the wavelength, again, <clears throat> it is our choice where we want to visualize it. But I can see that very clearly that either it's from crest to the next crest, and this value is 4. Or you can make it go like this. So one trough and one crest goes up to 5. So this is 1 up to 5. So the change is, again, 4 centimeters. So the wavelength does not change, okay, for the same graph. Now we know that the time period of oscillation is 0 0.6 seconds and found above. The wavelength is 4 centimeters as found above. He tells you to find out the, the speed of the wave. Now be careful, we have the formula as V equals to F lambda. So if I'm going to put frequency, I'm going to put 1 over T, which is 1 over 0 0.6, multiplied by wavelength, which is 4 centimeters. Now, ideally speaking, I tell my students to convert the units to centimeters, sorry, to meters, but over here the speed is mentioned in centimeters per second. So converting the units will not serve any purpose. So this will be 4 divided by 0 0.6, becoming 6.67 meters per second. You can write down 6.7. <clears throat> now we move towards phase difference. Now first, if we want to understand what is phase difference, the first condition that we need to understand is that it can only be found between the waves that have a constant frequency. In your syllabus, we need to make sure that they have a constant frequency, which means that they have the same time period. They will have the same frequency. It happens in two formats. Let's go about this step by step and see what's happening. First, let's understand what is phase and what a single oscillation actually looks like. And what are we trying to do? So let's visualize this and see. So on the right hand side, we have a wave. Here, we have a wave on the right hand side, right? So this part of the graph represents a simple wave, and this part represents a unit circle. Now, why I've chosen this animation, it actually tells you that a wave can be represented as a circle. Now, once we understand this, we can then move on to phases and phase differences. Basically, this unit circle is actually representing the phase of this wave. 
how each particle is actually connected to the wave visualization. And basically this angle with the reference of the origin is actually the phase. But we're not going to get into these details. We're just going to visualize that a circle can be used to represent a wave. That is all that we need to understand. So let's let this animation play out so that it can visualize properly. Again, I repeat that a circle can be represented to represent a wave. Now we move towards what is phase individually. What does that mean for a particle? Okay. So we move towards this visualization. Okay. So let's run this visualization and see what's actually happening. As you can see that there are two particles moving upwards and downwards. Particle A is in front of particle B. And we can see that the energy of the wave, the energy of the wave is traversing in this direction. So this is the direction where the energy is moving. Okay. So this point, this exact point is actually acting as the source of the wave, where the wave is being generated from. Right. And those two particles are actually just following the movement of that wave and notice that these particles are not moving forward they're not moving backward they're just sharing this common position okay all right now notice that there is slight difference between them so if i just pause this animation for a second we can see how that difference is being visualized now at this point we can see that there is slight difference between them what is that difference so if i extend this line of sight and I extend this line of sight, I realize that there is a certain gap between them. This is the phase difference which we were trying to visualize with the unit circle. Right? So one particle is actually in the leading position and one particle is actually lagging behind. But they are, e they are following each other. Okay? So particle A is leading, particle B is following particle A. But how far back is it in terms of time? How far is it away from particle A? This is phase difference. If I just look at one particle, I'm actually talking about phase, which we just discussed at this point, which was over here. If I look at one particle, I'm actually talking about simple phase. But if I'm talking about two particles on a wave, then that constitutes two phase difference. Now, what happens if we have two waves that are actually a, a bit different from each other? What happens over here? How to see this? So let's come at this point in which we have two waves actually at a difference from each other. So let's play this animation and see what it looks like. Now, for the sake of understanding, let's one more time see that this side represents the waves. And this side represents how they are connected with the unit circle. Right? Now notice how one of them moves and how the other one moves. Okay? Let's play this animation. So as you can see in this situation, each particle on the blue wave and the green wave has a representation on the unit circle to tell you what, what is the angle and how they are moving. Now to visualize phase difference, precisely if you want to visualize phase difference, that is basically the angle between them at this point. Now luckily for us right now, we are comparing costs with signs so the angle between them is 90 degrees otherwise this is that phase difference now how do you calculate this what you can do is you can choose two similar points on both waves and then find the difference now notice that we understand that for phase difference it has to be either same time period or it has to be either same frequency we understand this much at least okay so in this case if the frequency is same then i can choose the frequency from anyone I can choose the frequency from green wave up to this point, or I can choose the frequency from the purple wave, which is up from this point up to this point. It would not matter. Both time periods will be exactly the same. So I've selected my time period. Now I want to find out the difference of time between them. Now, where do I find them? It's my choice where I choose them. So a common uh, place for them to be is start choosing when both of them become zero, either from this point or either from this point, or choosing when both of them actually attain their peaks or the lowest values. So one green peak is at this point, 
and purple peak is at this point. So this also qualifies for the time difference. So this difference is actually called delta T or the difference of time between them from this point to this point. This can also go from the lowest point to the lowest point of this one, which is again going to be called delta T. Now we know the time period of one of the waves. So the phase difference formula actually becomes delta T. What is delta T? The difference between the waves, which actually lies at this location or wherever you want to find it. Okay. Divided by the total time period, which is T for this equation. And remember, it can be picked from anyone. Green or purple doesn't matter because we know that they are both same. Multiplied by either 360 degrees or you can multiply this with 2 pi based on this idea, whether you're finding the angle in pi radians or you're right finding the angle in degrees. Okay. So this is how we visualize phase difference. That angle, the answer that you're going to get basically actually gives you this angle between the vectors on the phase diagram. Okay, let us let me run this animation once more so that you can visualize it properly and let us try to solve questions regarding this concept. I hope that we understand how phase is actually working and what is the phase difference which is actually between them. Okay, so let us come back to this point. Now over here, phase difference, the formula for phase difference is going to be simply delta T, the difference between them multiplied by T divided by t and then multiply by 360 degrees. If I were to find out the phase difference between them, it's my choice. I can do anything. I can choose any point. I choose zero of the first wave and then zero of the second wave. This wave is also crossing zero point at this point. So the delta t I find from the graph is actually 0 0.2. Now notice you can find this value at any point. Okay. You can either choose this point to this point, but I would not recommend this why because then you'll have to count the number of boxes precisely and it's going to increase the number of work. It's going to increase the effort that is required to do that. Again, similarly, if a student wants to choose the peak values, for example, a student says, I will choose this point for the first wave and this point for the second wave. Again, this delta T will still come out as 0 0.2 if you count the number of boxes. It will still be the same. But again, this is going to add the effort. So I'm going to skip this part. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to do it the simplest way, which is very obvious right in front of me. Zero of the first wave and then zero of the second wave. What, what do we mean when we say zero? Basically, we have to see where the wave actually starts from. So if I observe, this wave is actually starting at this point because the amplitude is zero. This wave is starting at this point because its amplitude is zero as well. So when do they start? How far back is one wave from the other? How late is one wave from the other? So this started at time zero and this started at time 0 0.2 seconds after the first wave had started. So this is that phase difference. And let's now look at the time period of any wave. And you will see that it won't matter which one I choose because both waves have the same frequency. So if I choose the simplest one, which is 0 to 0 0.6, my actual time period comes out as 0 0.6. I can just be done with it. But to uh, explore more options, I could have selected this second wave starting from 0 0.2 and going up to 0 0.8 one crest phase, one trough phase, and I see wave Q is completed. Notice it starts from 0 0.2, ends at 0 0.8. If you find the difference between them, this will be 0 0.6. So it didn't matter. I choose the value from P, but Q gives me the same value. So I'm going to choose the easiest options and try to avoid getting confused in the process. So I end up with these options. Okay. Now I have to find the phase difference between them. What I can do is the difference between them divided by the actual time. 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.6 multiplied by 360. If you calculate this, the answer that you get is going to be 120 degrees. Right? So if I go back to the visualization that we've just done over here, what does this mean? What this 120 degree means? Although this is not going to sound, this is not going to become exactly equal at this point. But what does that mean? It means that this angle between the two waves is 120 degrees. And another way to visualize this phase difference is not only that this is the angle at the center, it's not going to be just the angle at the center, let's say 120 degrees. You can also choose an angle on the outer side. You can also choose this angle. Let's say this one is going to be 240 degrees. So if somebody was asking you about the phase difference, it is 120 and it is 240 at the same time. Whatever option is given to you in the question, you will see that there is a question which is going to be solved by this idea. So. Let's go back. So now we understand what is phase difference. Now let's come to this question. Now on the, this axis, we have only phase angle, but we don't, if we want to measure the exact locations of time and exact locations of the angles, it will become difficult. 
So instead of doing that, I'm going to go for the easy option, which is when do they start at zero? After how much time do they start? So this starts at zero. This starts at 100 degrees after the first wave. So I can see that the phase difference, very straightforward, is actually 100 degrees. And in terms of this idea, the difference between the vectors of both waves is actually 100 degrees. But notice that this option is not given in the questions. What will you do now? So we go back to this idea and we realize that this 120 is also the correct answer. We can also choose an option that is on the outer side. That is on the outer side. So if this is 100, then the outer will be actually 260. How? Because 100 plus 260 has to give me a full circle of 360. So this is how you visualize it. This is how you see the question. So I see that this full should be actually 260 degrees because the full circle is 360. Or you can simply say that 360 minus 100 will be my next option to choose. So that is 260 and this is option C. Again, please remember this is the angle between the vectors when you find it. Over here we have a question. It says uh, we, the velocity is given, frequency is given. It asks us what is the distance between the particles which have a phase distance of 60 degrees. Now notice these are not waves. These are actually the same particles of the same wave. And where we have seen that, we have seen that in this visualization. This one, it is the same wave, but two particles are actually moving along the wave. And one particle A, which is the red one, is actually ahead of particle B. It is moving faster, or you can say it is moving uh, first. It is taking the first step first, and B particle is following A. So this is what he's asking you. What is the phase difference between these particles? Now, how do we do that? We use the same idea. First, we need, since he's asking us in terms of wavelengths, the distance, it's the answers are in wavelengths or meters. We're going to find out the wavelength first. So V is equal to F lambda. We have a 330 equals to F is 50. And let's find lambda. So lambda comes out as lambda is 6.6 .6 meters. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I were to draw a full wave like this one, it will go up to 6.6 .6 meters in terms of distance and meters. And in terms of angles only, it would have been 0, 90, 180, 270 and a complete 360 and why is this is 360 because we know that this is equally drawn on a circle like this and this moves along the circle so he says what particles are actually 60 degrees apart how what would be the distance between them so i know that the difference of wavelength between the particles compared to the wavelength multiplied by 360 should be equal to 60 degrees what he's asking me this is exactly the same idea that we are observing over here what should be the distance between them in terms of wavelength if this is the full wavelength let's say Yes, so if this is the full wavelength, from this point to this point, if this is the full wavelength, what is the difference or distance between the particles which are actually 60 degrees away from each other in terms of angles? So we are going to apply the formula as delta A lambda, change in lambda, compare this with the original lambda as delta lambda divided by lambda, and then multiply by 360, and our answer is supposed to be 60 degrees are given in the question. So this is what we want to find out. 6.6 .6 is what we calculated using V is equal to F lambda. Let's try to see what we get. So the answer of this delta lambda comes out as 1.1. This comes out as 1.1. That means that if this whole wavelength, let's say I'm starting from this point, if uh, this one whole wavelength from this point to this point, from this point to this point, if this is 6.6, .6, then the particles that are actually 60 degrees apart from each other, they will have a distance of from this point to, let's say, this point, they will be 1.1 meters away from each other. So this 60 degrees is actually 1.1 meters away. These two particles are 1.1 meter away from, the, from each other if this was the case. I hope that this is clear now. Let's go back to the lesson. All right, so we understand what is phase difference and what is phase, how to visualize phase. Please don't forget this. We will be using this in the next parts of the video as well in the complete series of waves. Then we come to the topic of intensity because that is the last part of the course as well, of this chapter at least. So intensity is actually power per unit area, which becomes watts per meter square. So there are other formulas for this as well. The first formula that we frequently use is instance intensity is proportional to amplitude square. The second that we use intensity is R squared, distance from the source, right? And why does that happen? Why is this an inverse square with the distance? Okay, now notice that this is also distance. Please be advised how to use this formula if you are comparing two situations. What you can do is divide two situations with one another. So it will be I1 
divided by I2 equals to A1 square divided by A2 square. How to use the other equation, that is with the distance, how to visualize it so that it becomes this equation. Please be advised that if you're comparing I1 proportional to 1 over R1 square and comparing with I2 proportional to 1 over R2 square, if you divide both of these equations, mathematically speaking, what's going to happen is this R2 is going to come up and R1 is going to come down. You can perform the algebra on your own, pause the video and do that for yourself. You will realize that this is going to be I1 equals to R2 square divided by I2 divided by R1 square. Because of these fractions, they're going to interchange places and this is what it's going to look like. One is in the denominator, but its distance is in the numerator. Two is in the numerator, but its distance is in the denominator, whole square. So uh, we will be using these equations frequently in the MCQs as well. So that's why it's important to understand them. So either you choose it this way or either you can do it this way. Otherwise, if values are given, then you can do it this way as well. Power divided by area into intensity. And why area is inversely related to intensity and distance is, distance is inversely related to intensity? We can see that in this diagram that as you move away from the source, this is the source of the power, this is the source of the energy. As you move away, the respective cross-sectional area through which the number of lines have to move through increases when you move away from the source. Because the light rays are diverging, this energy source is diverging from each other. So more number of lines, or you can say the area spreads out and the number of lines passing through a certain area decrease, which is why the intensity falls, which is why if you travel away from a light bulb, you can see that after a certain time, the shadow of the light bulb, the light of the light bulb actually fades away. Similar area can be represented over here. Similar idea that if you are very close to each other, then the intensity will be high because the area is very small. The same number of lines are spread out in larger areas, so intensity decreases I by 4. The same number of lines are now extended over even larger. They have to be spread out on an even larger area. The intensity, intensity will decrease and see that if you are 2D, the intensity is 1 by 4. 3D, intensity 1 by 9. How is this happening? So intensity is proportional to 1 over R square. So if you put in, let's say, 1 over 2R square, then this becomes 1 over 4R. So intensity has reduced 4 times. Similar case for 3D. If you put it 3R and then take a square, this becomes 1 over 9R. So intensity would have reduced by 9 times. So I hope that we understand these formulas. Now let's try to use them in the equations. Uncommon questions. So the first question we have is the amplitude is given to us and we understand that intensity first, very quickly write down, intensity is proportional to amplitude square. Now he says that the frequency is same amplitude of two-way, what's the new intensity? So I'm comparing intensity and amplitude, so I'm going to use the equation with I1 is equal to A1 square divided by I2 divided by A2 square. I can choose my values of my choice. Now I know that the original amplitude was A, so that will be A square. Uh, right? Oh, sorry. The new amplitude is 2A and divided by the old amplitude is A square. So I'm placing these values over here. So I'm keeping new case on the numerator and old case in the denominator. And this intensity, old intensity was given to me as 3. So what this comes down to as I1 is equal to 2A square divided by 2 square A square divided by A square multiplied by 3. So this, since this is 2 whole square, this becomes 4 A square divided by A square multiplied by 3. This comes out as A gets cancelled out. This comes out as 12. So the answer for this question is 12, right? There is another way of solving that, but that is going to increase the time for this uh, uh, solving this MCQ. But that is more acceptable in terms of mathematics because this looks a bit complex. Uh, you, what you can do is you can simply make the equation I equals to K times A square. Why? Because turning proportionality into constant or into inequality requires a constant. So we know that 3 is equal to k times small a square. So k becomes 3 divided by a square. This is method number 2, right? What you can do now is put in the new situation for i equals to k a or a square. k remains constant throughout the situ situation, which is 3 divided by a square into the new amplitude, which is 2a whole square. So you'll realize that what you get at the end of the day is going to be this one. This a square gets cancelled with this a square and this is 3 multiplied by 2 whole square which is going to be 12 again. Okay, so I hope that this is understandable. Let's move to the next question. We have this question from May 2008, one of the very common questions. Again, it tells you about the distance intensity relationship which we just discussed at the very beginning of the relationship of this topic. Okay, let's see what's happening in this situation. Let's try to solve this uh, much more easily or much more in a much more acceptable manner. 
So I'm going to use the ratio method, but it's going to be in this way. So please try to keep up. I realize that 1 over I1, so let's say I1 situation is proportional to 1 over R1 square. So if I compare this with, let's say, an I2 situation with 1 over R2 square, then this is going to look like this equation, which I just explained to you why the variables have exchanged. Right? Okay. Let's try to do this. It tells me that a distance of R, the particles at P, are oscillating at 8 micrometers. They are oscillating, they are vibrating with 8 micrometers. Uh, what's happening? What's going to happen to the particles at Q? Okay, what's going to happen to them? So let's try to solve this situation. So we have a relationship that says that <clears throat> the okay, so one thing this is intensity with distance, and I know that intensity is proportional to amplitude square. Okay, so I realize that this is amplitude square and this is 1 over r square. So I can equate both of them, and I can see that amplitude square. Is now proportional to 1 over r square <coughs> sorry so what you can do is either choose the equation with r square or take a carry with square or what you can do is cancel the square on both sides and end up with an equation which is a proportional to 1 over r which is going to make things simple for you otherwise it's your choice so <coughs> a1 is equal to 1 over r1 divided by a2 divided by 1 over r Let's replace the values in this situation and what we end up with is uh, the new, the old amplitude was 8, the old distance was r, the new distance is 2r. What do we end up with? <clears throat> we end up with uh, this r2 going up and r1 coming down. So we are, are going to write it this way. So this is going to be r divided by 2r and this if a2 goes to that side it's going to get multiplied which is going to be a2. So r gets cancelled with r. And A2 has a value of 8. So what are we left with? We're left with 8 divided by 2, which is the new amplitude which we were carrying on the other side. So we are left with 4. If you want to solve this with squares, you're not convinced, you can try the same method that I've done over here with squares. So it's going to look something like this. A1 square divided by A2 square equals to 1 over 2R whole square divided by 1 over R whole square. If you solve this, you will end up with the same answer of 4, which is going to be the option D. Moving on to this question, uh, he says that intensity is power over the cross-sectional area. That is okay. We understand that. How does amplitude of the vibrating molecule related to R? Now, intensity over here is proportional to 1 over R square. And we know that intensity is also proportional to 1 over, sorry, A square, right? So if I combine these two equations, because they are both equal to I, I can say that a square is proportional to 1 over r square. Now, we don't see that equation in this situation, so we can just simply take the under root on both sides and end up with an equation that a is inversely proportional to r. So, you'll end up with option a. And you can, you can see that I've included this question exactly for this reason, because if we go back to this option, I told you, I gave you an option that you can either try this with the square method, which I have just written down for you, or either you can do this by cancelling out the square, by cancelling the square, because it doesn't matter, there it exists on both sides. So over here we have proven that, that either a, this relationship actually comes from A square being inversely proportional to R square. Okay. Uh, now this question is a bit tricky. Please note that uh, which year this is from. He is going to confuse you in words. What he has done, he says that a light has an amplitude of A. Okay, well and good. Normally on a surface area of S, the power per unit area is P. This is where he confuses you. He says that the power reaching per unit area is P. Now we know that intensity is basically power per unit area. We know that. What he has done, he says that P is power per unit area over here. So what he's saying is that instead of I, you can write down P because I is power per unit area. And this whole thing in English is being represented as P now. So we say that intensity is proportional or is equal to P. We know that intensity is also proportional to A squared. And we also know that intensity is inversely proportional to the distance. Right? Uh, just a moment. So this is our first equation. And the second equation is intensity is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Because we know that uh, intensity linked with area is over here. So intensity is inversely proportional to area. So this is equation number two. Now I know that what he has done is that 
in English, in English statement, he says that intensity is now the new P. Replace that variable. So instead of I, I'm going to write down P. Instead of I, I'm going to write down P in both of them. So this equation number one actually becomes P proportional to A square. Now, we know that this is not power. This P is not power because we know that this is power per unit area. But he has said so, so we have to, we have to oblige. Now, and the second equation turns to be key, to become P is inversely proportional to S. So if you combine both of these equations, we end up with P being equal, let's say, to A squared divided by S. You can either take this as a proportionality as well, because if you convert proportionality to inequality, there needs to be a constant, but the constant does not change. So it's not involved in the situation, mathematically speaking, right? So I'm just simply writing, it, writing this down as A squared over S. So this is our formula for P. Now he says that, uh, Amplitude is increased to 2a and area is reduced by 1 by 3. So I'm going to put in the new values. Our new amplitude is 2a whole square divided by area has been reduced by 3 times. So this 3 is going to go up. What were we going to end up with? 3 multiplied by now this 2a square becomes 4a square. Now s is over here as it is. We realize that this a square over s is basically my original power or the standard formula for power so this new p dash or the p new formula the new p is actually equal to 3 by 4 multiplied by the old p or you can say the standard formula for p which is a square over s we're just replacing the variable so we end up with 12 p as the new p so this is going to be my answer as option c